Hi everyone, and welcome to a special episode of my podcast. Today I'm here with Grant Kirkhope. Hello. Yes. How you doing? <laughs> so, um, Grant, tell me a little bit about yourself and your career. Uh, well, I'm a composer. Uh, I've done tons of video games. I started in like 1995 at Rare. Uh, so my first kind of project, well, the first project I ever touched was converting um, Diddy Kong's Quest Donkey Kong Country 2 yep. to uh, the original Game Boy. And then I did a GoldenEye and Banjo-Kazooie, Donkey Kong 64, Banjo-Tooie, Perfect Dark, that kind of thing. Yeah, no, that's, that's amazing. There's a lot of uh, very notable games. Well, yeah, I, I just think I was lucky at the time, right? Sometimes you just fall lucky. I think I just fell lucky. So it's kind of, it's managed to give me a career for the last 24 years. So it's been pretty, it's been pretty amazing, really. Yeah, no, it's, I can imagine it would be. So so how did the, the whole thing with Rare start? And uh, before that, were you previously familiar with video games? And did you know of the Donkey Kong character? So... Like I used to, when I, I went to music college, right, in the UK, it's, it's called the Royal Northern College of Music, which is a proper kind of conservatoire, classical thing. Yeah. So I did a four-year degree there as a classically trained trumpet player. Yeah. Uh, prior to that, I was kind of a self-taught metal guitar player, so I'm about 12 or 13. I played trumpet when I was about six. Oh, wow. Uh, so um, after leaving, I played in metal bands prior to going to university, so when, after I left, I really didn't have a lot of interest in playing trumpet. I wanted to be a metal guitar player, like, you know, I wanted to be an Iron Maiden or Judas Priest, something like that. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. And so uh, I did spend the next sort of 11 years, really, playing in uh, rock bands and also some some bands on trumpet, too. So I played in a quite a big UK rock band called Little Angels. I played trumpet for them, and I played trumpet for a band called Zoot and the Roots, so who were quite a big sort of, kind of a uni circuit band in the day. Yeah. Plus metal bands on my own. So I did that for about 11 years, sort of 22 till 33, so quite a long time. And I still, I still live at home with my mother. I had moved out, you know, which is a bit, uh, you know, that put some of that age is a bit probably not very good. <laughs> yeah. So I was playing in like, also playing in local kind of rock bands too, covers bands to make a living, you know. So I spent most of my time, um, you know, signing on unemployment benefit and then going on tour and then coming back and back at unemployment benefit off and on for like all that 11 years. Yeah. And a friend of mine called Robin Beanland, who's oh, a yeah. keyboard player in one of the local bands that I played for. Um, Update up one day announced that I've got a job. I'm like, what? Like, you know, knowing that I knew you got a job, right? Everyone that I knew just played in bands and went on unemployment when they didn't play in bands. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, uh, so, yeah, I've got a job at Rare, right? Me to the computer games. I was like, what? You know, I couldn't believe it. Like, yeah, I could, it was just amazing. So off he went, you know. Um, so I was a big, I, quite, I was a big games player at the time. I had a, uh, like a, a the original SNES and was kind of my first console. I got the Game Boy before that, but the SNES was the first kind of console that I bought at home. I did play a lot of arcade machines in the arcades. Yeah. Um, yeah. So a year and a half went by and he said to me, um, Grant, you know, you've been on unemployment benefit for about 11 years. Don't you think it's time you tried to get a job, you know? Wow. And I said, well, you know, what can I do? He said, why don't you try to do what I'm doing? Why don't you try to write me to the computer games? So he recommended that I bought, um, I bought an Atari ST computer, a copy of Cubase, which is a sequencing program, mm-hmm. and a synth module to play sounds out of. Yep. And I spent the next year, really, writing songs that I thought would be appropriate for video games. And I sent Rare... Uh, five cassette tapes in those days um, over the course of that year never got a reply and then out the blue I got a letter saying please come for an interview um, wow. which was completely bizarre and then I got interviewed by David Wise and Simon Farmer who's the general manager yep. and the letter asked me to bring along a, a piece I'd written like a, in, in the style of a kind of fighting game with a guitar based fighting game piece because they were doing Kill It at the time mm-hmm. uh, a platformer type piece and a Batman sort of orchestral piece so I kind of wrote those in a week hurriedly and went down to the interview and, you know, to my amazement, got the job. Wow. Uh, so it was completely, it was a complete fluke. Robin never never said, suggested it. I'd never done it. It's complete fluke. That's, that's, that's amazing. That's genuinely an amazing story. See, I, I knew, I knew a little bit about how you'd um, gotten involved with it. I'd read a little bit, but that, it really, you, it really was, as you say, you were very, very lucky to get into that. Yeah, I mean, it was an absolute fluke. I mean, I was, all the friends that I knew back then, uh, a lot of them now are still playing in covers bands, you know, in the local area where I used to live. And that's you know, not doing not doing so well. And that would have been me, quite literally. Like I would yeah. have been doing that this day. Um, it is, yeah, it's an absolute fluke. I mean, there's no, there's no way to put. It's just a complete stroke of luck. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, you, I think the music you ended up writing for those games was fantastic, and um, I'm, I'm sure many other people agree. Well, I'm glad you like it. <laughs> so. So I'm sure you've uh, told the story hundreds of times, but how did the the dream project sort of come about? 
So I've been at Rare a little while. I, I, I kind of lose track of the timeline here. So I, I started in October '95. Mm-hmm. My first job was doing the Game Boy thing, and then I did GoldenEye. And then um, at that time, um, the original Donkey Kong Country team, who we were kind of uh, Tim Stamper was one of the bosses. Tim and Chris Stamper, yep. like the, the, both the bosses were on a team. So Tim was on the original Donkey Kong Country team, and they were kind of the golden team at Rare, really, because Donkey Kong Tr- Country had sold like 10 million copies and done amazingly well. Yeah. So, but just after that, they sort of split off because Tim said, if somebody else can take, can take the reins of the next game now, we, we need to go and do something new. So it was kind of a, Dream was a big secret project to Rare when I got there. And Dave Wise was doing the music. Um, so one day, I remember I was sitting in my little room in Rare and um, I knew who Tim was. And he, what, he just walked into the room with this young guy who I didn't know who he was. And, and this Tim sat on the floor and this young guy sat in the chair. And I was like, oh my God, if Tim's on the floor, he was, this, he was some super important journalist or something like that, you know. <laughs> he said to me, can you just play some of your GoldenEye tunes, please? In a very straight voice. I thought, oh God, I'm going to get fired. I'm getting sacked. So it, it, my, my tunes are crap, you know. <laughs> um, so I played a few and he just said, yes. So we like the way you rearrange the, um, the Bond melodies in lots of different ways. He said, uh, and th- I knew that uh, Tim said that he was a big fan of the Monkey Island games, uh, yeah. the LucasArts games, how the music morphed as you wandered around. Mm-hmm. So he'd like to come and join our dream team with, to, to work with Dave. And I said, oh yeah, that's fine. I said, you know, I just got to finish off Golden Eye. He said, no, 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 that's it now. Golden Eye's finished. <laughs> Can't be move across to the bar, move across to where we are. I was like, oh. So off I went. Um, and then. So it's still, it's still Dream then. It was kind of that kind of RPG thing. I guess pr- pretty Zelda-like, really. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it switched from the SNES to the N64. They were still going to make, even though the N64 was going at Rare, they still wanted to make it on the original SNES, but then they changed their minds that went onto the N64. Um, and it was going to be using that, that 64 DD, that disk drive that sat below it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Extra memory and an extra sound chip in it and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so, um, that, so I worked it off a little while with Dave. And then at the same time, upstairs from where I was with the Dream Team, uh, Chris Stamper had the, uh, I think it's called like RC Pro-Am Racing, what is an old rare, uh, not rare, Ultimate Play the Game game they had years ago. Yeah. And they were remaking it for the N64. Mm-hmm. So Tim said to me, look, Chris hasn't got a, a, a music guy. It's stupid having you and Dave work on the same game. Dave's going to go and do the racing game, you, and you're going to stay here. And I was like, oh shit, right, okay. <laughs> so that was the first that was the first game I'd ever done by myself because I'd done Goldeneye with Graham Norgay. Yeah. Um so um, you know, to get given that dream game to myself was pretty amazing. Yeah. And what that went along for a little while. So I lose track of time I said I can't quite work the timeline out. So Dave went off to do Diddy it wasn't it wasn't called Diddy Kong Racing then, it was called RC Prime Racing. Yes. So we went to go and do that. And then a little bit of time we were on Dream for a good while. Um, but it wasn't working so great because we had this kind of a really elaborate um system where the, all the floor was made of small polygons so you could stretch it to any shapes we can make elaborate like landscapes but the n64 couldn't really run it very well because it was so processor intensive yeah but at the same time conquer's 12 tales was going back then with uh, that team yeah, so yeah. yeah yeah they were using the kind of same system as mario 64 like big floor textures so it was a lot easier to run you know classic kind of it looked the kind of, looked very like mario 64 and ran fantastically well so one day tim said us right Everyone come across. We all trooped across to the Conquer barn where they all were, and they showed us the original, the, the, the original Conquer thing where running around the windmill on the lightning strikes. It was just amazing. We were all super depressed because it looked fantastic, and our game wasn't very good at all. <laughs> uh, and then we got marched back to our room. So Tim, Tim said, "Right, that's it. We're scrapping this this dream game. We're going to start off. We're going to make a platform game like Mario 64, like Conquer. We're going to use the same system that they're that they're using. Get on with it. We're going to change it all. You know, all that stuff." We're like, oh god, so we're starting over again. I've written 170 pieces of music for Dream, so most of those got scrapped. Oh my god! I did use some later on for bits and pieces, but most of it got scrapped. Wow! Uh, and it was like, right, we're going to make a platform game. The main character's going to change. So we had a rabbit at the start, um, and then it changed to a bear. Yes. And Tim was very adamant that you need to, all the all the all the uh, characters need to be called after musical instruments, like banjo. Tutti was called uh, uh, not Tutti. Um, she was called Piccolo originally. Yes. Uh, everything was like instrument names. You know, it, it would play in the music. Uh, and so um, that went along, went along and that was it. And then eventually it got a bear and then they, they wanted Banjo to fly. So they put a backpack on his back because that was a very trendy thing in Japan at the time. All the kids were wearing the backpacks. Yeah. And then we put wings in the backpack to make him fly. And then it was like, because, it, because there's wings in there, why don't we have a whole bird? And then it all just kind of snowballed, snowballed on from that point, you know. So, um yeah, and I mean, you know, that was it. So we just changed to Banjo Kazooie, and that was it. 
Yeah, no, I, um, I was sort of aware of that, but once again, hearing that in, in depth sort of makes sense, because I know David Wise went and did uh, what became Diddy Kong Racing, so, and then uh, obviously Robin Beanland did um, the, the, the Conquer game, so it all sort of adds up. Yeah, yeah, like we all, usually you'd get your own game to do in those days, so you did all the sound effects, all the music, so Banjo-Kazooie and Banjo-Tooie, I did all the music and all the sound effects, you did the whole lot, that's how it worked then. That's amazing, yeah. So, um, I think you've already partially answered this, but how did you actually sort of arrange, write the music? Uh, was it done on a computer synth program? I think you said it was Cubase. Yeah, so Rare Red Cubase back in the day, and that's what we used for most of the time. We, we switched a bit later, but right at the start was Cubase. Yeah. Uh, and we had this, work, so you basically had a, an N64 dev machine. It was like a circuit board that sat inside a Silicon Graphics indie computer, which is very expensive computers. Like Rare was so rich they could afford them. There were a lot of, them, <laughs> a lot of those computers, the, the SGI machines were like, were like the bee's knees in the day. They were like amazing machines, super expensive, like 20 grand a piece. Yeah. Um, so we all had one of those, you know, bizarrely enough. Um, and so, but so you'd, you'd, you'd make up your little kind of MIDI sample orchestra. So I'd find, let's say, a clarinet that I liked. I'd sample a clarinet, one note, I'd make it small, reduce the, reduce the sample rate down from 44 kilohertz, which is CD quality, down to like something like 16 kilohertz or 8 kilohertz, it, it, as, you know, as low as I could get without it sounding completely awful, yep. to save any space. Yep. You stick it in the N64, and then our computers were, were hooked up to the N64 via a, a cable. So we could actually physically play the samples inside the N64. So rather than write a piece of music using full quality samples and sound amazing and try and crunch it down to make it sound, you know, fit in the N64, we actually played the samples in the, in the N64. So that, that's, I think, one of the reasons why Rage Music was quite good in those days because, we, you know, we would, you, you know, you'd start to understand that certain samples were good for, good for some things, certain samples were good for other things. So you weren't trying to make that sample do something it didn't sound very good at. Yeah. So wrote the music with the thing you had available to you yes yeah. it makes a difference it makes you you understand the limitations and you use everything to its strengths and that's why it sounds better yeah so that's how we did it yeah so um there was no point where uh, the music got exported from cubase onto like a digital audio tape or not not none of that or no not really like i uh, Gold and I, I did write sort of six tunes at full quality. Yep. That's only because I was waiting for a dev kit to turn up. Yep. So wrote stuff, you know, using, using the synths at full quality and just recorded them to a DAT tape, to, to, so you know, so I knew how they went. Yep. But then I just had to convert them all to, to work on the N64. So usually nothing was written full quality. It was all written with the samples in the N64. So yeah, that's the way it works. Yeah, so that makes me wonder, is it actually possible to, you know, pull out those samples from the, the ROM and then, like, sort of... Because they're... No, hang on, no, you wouldn't be able to sort of reconstruct them, would you? Or is that possible? Well, they're all, they all sit in the NC4, they're all compressed, right, using the AIFC. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, um... I guess you could extract them, but in, because it's already compressed, it's already lost the quality that was there in the first place. You can't re-add it. It's not there. You know what I mean? It's like something. I think people get a bit confused about yep, yep. Um, the compressed music on the N64. I think they think that the whole track was compressed down and put on the N64. The whole track never existed at full quality. That's that's never. what I was always wondering about. So, so it yeah. wasn't it wasn't like a MIDI that was put on there either. So yeah, I get what you're saying now. It makes sense. But the, well, well, the MIDI file goes on the N64 and it, it plays the samples in the N64. Right, That's right. It. So what would have to be so, done was the the samples would have to be recreated from scratch to make like a full. Yeah. Oh, that's crazy! Yeah. That's crazy. But you have, you have to have access to the original the original machines that we use, like the the synths that I used to sample the instruments in the first place. You'd have to have all that stuff that I used to get it back to where it was. That's insane. But it's it makes sense that back then that's the way it was done. It quite frankly was genius for its time. Well, I mean, you, you had no choice. You, you, had, you know, had to save memory all the time. There was no way around it. You know, like, you know, I would sample one clarinet note. So, like, if you... When I use my huge sample libraries these days, the huge orchestral libraries, they've sampled every note individually. Yeah. You know, every single note's got its own sample. I could sample one note. So, when you played it low, it was like, whoa, 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 whoa. When you played it high, it was like Mickey Mouse. Yeah. So, you had to stretch that one note over the entire keyboard. Yeah. So... You know, that, that C3 that I sampled wasn't meant to be played at A3 or, 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 or G1. It wasn't meant to sound like that, so it sounded awful. Yeah. So, you know, that's a lot of people think I'm a big marimba fan, and I do like the marimba. But the point is that that one sample sounded great everywhere. Yes. All over the key. It didn't make a difference. So, because it sounded good, I used it all the time, because it sounded good. 
it wasn't because I was a, a huge marimba fan. It was just that that sample sounded good, so I knew I could use it and it would sound good. Yep. Yes. So adding on to that, sort of did the song pro songwriting process. What was that sort of like? Did did you ever demo songs before doing a full mix in the way you explained? Um, well, I write it. I usually used to write a whole piece and play it. So, like, I worked with Greg Mayles most closely. I was on Greg's team for the entire time I was at Rare. Yeah. So, um, so I'd write a piece and play it to him, and he'd like it or not. Yeah. Um, that was that was the way it went. Yeah. You know? you, that, that's how you did it. Yeah. So you technically did demo it, but it was sort of live. You just you played it for him. Yeah. Oh, no, I'd, I'd actually, no, I'd write the piece of music and it'd be, it'd be in the N64 working. I, I, I mean, I can't... I oh, right, play, right, yeah, right, yeah. yeah. I couldn't just play the piano part and say, what do you think of it? It would, it would sound... It's, I'd, pl- I'd write the whole piece, I'd get it in the N64, it, it sounded exactly as it sounded in the game, and he'd say yes or no, and I'd, if he didn't like it, I'd start again. Okay, yeah, that well, that makes sense to me. That's a really, really interesting way of, you know, writing music. It's really... That's how I do it now, it's not changed, it's the same thing. Except that these days, I do tend to sort of... Like with Mario Rabbids, when I did that, I'd send them the first maybe 16, 32 bars and say, is this the kind of style you like? Is this right for the level or right for the thing? And then it said, yes or no, and I'd, I'd, I'd carry on from there. So it saves me, not everyone likes to work like that, but the, the guys that I work with, work with are quite keen to do that. Because it means that I write a little bit of music, they get the gist of it, they work out whether they like it or not, and then say, carry on, I'll start again. So it saves me writing a whole piece of music and polishing it up and saying no and starting again after you've wasted two weeks or whatever, you know. So, yeah, it's a bit like that. Okay, that makes that makes a lot of sense. So, um, did you ever have a favourite track from Banjo Kazooie or Donkey Kong sixty four? Banjo Kazooie is a difficult one. Like I do, I used, I used to always say Mad Monster Mansion, but I think it's probably Freeze Easy Peaks now. Yes. I think I do like. I just find that that's such a jolly piece of music, and I like, I do like that an awful lot. I think with DK, that's a tough one. I used to really like the uh, Creepy Castle. Oh yeah, I like that one. Yeah. Uh, but I do like the, the factory too. That um, whatever it's called, I've got the name of it now. That, because it's got like a music box at the start of it. I quite like that kind of sound of it. Yes. So, yeah. I mean, in my mind, I kind of because I was doing Banjo Tui and Perfect Dark and DK64 at this all at the same time. I had to, I was trying to separate DK from Banjo Tui, being both being platform games. And I, in my mind, I kind of feel that DK is a bit darker. Mm-hmm. It may not be, but that's how I kind of, you know guessed it in my mind it was like it felt darker to me yeah no i i agree i'm i i think it is darker so that sort of uh begs the question did you did you do voices in some of these games as well Um, most of them really i think you know a lot of the time back then i used to make noises because nobody else wanted to do it so it was quick for you to just do it and stick it in there so you know i was a ginger i was mumbo jumbo i was dk oh wow um a lot of the um, the baddies in Banjo Banjo Kazooie, it's me just making like rrr, 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 funny noises like that, you know. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I did, I did tons of it. I mean, later on, a lot of the dev teams were, were super keen to be the voice of stuff. So when they did Pinata, a lot of the dev guys became the animals, you know. So in the old, in, in the end of it, they were kind of fighting to see who could get the most animals at the, by the end of it. All. But in the early days, no one wanted to do it. So I just did it myself. Yeah. No, it makes sense. And I've, I think I've heard the story about um, the the chant that you sampled for Mumbo's um, thing, which I thought was really funny. Oh, yeah. That was a kind of a British... I don't know, it might be Australian, too. It's kind of British saying that, come and have a go if you think you're hard enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so yeah, I just did that, and you know, it's kind of worked out the way it did. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah, it was quite a funny story. So, mm. so how did you find yourself doing music for the Mario Rabbids game? Uh, that was one of the all-time surprises of my entire life. Like, if someone had told me that I would be doing Mario in ni- when I started in 1995, I would never believe it. Like, <laughs> to get to work, that character is just off the scale, incredible. Yeah. Um, so Davide Soliani, who's the creative director uh, at Ubisoft Milan. Is it was a big Banjo Kazooie fan, yeah. and so I think the minute he got to do the Mario game, he thought I'd love to get Grant to do it. And he really thought I would just say no. I don't know why he thought that. But he thought I would. <laughs> um, so his producer friend, who's Gian Marco Zana, uh, sent me a little, a very professional email on LinkedIn, yeah. saying, uh, "Dear Mr. Kirkup, it was very polite. Um, uh, we have a game going on over here that uh, we think you'd be perfect for. I, you know, are you interested?" And I was, and I was like, "Yeah, of course. You know, whatever it is." So we signed the NDA, and it just—it was, it was just called um, Rabbit's Kingdom Battle. So I knew, I knew it was a rabbit game. And I thought cool because my kids watched the rabbits cartoons yeah. and thought they were really funny, and I thought they're funny too. They're great. I mean, I, th- I feel the rabbits kind of predate the minions. They were—they were the crazy things that the minions are now, you know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so um, it was all uh, the contract got signed to do a little bit of music at the start, and then they wanted to fly me over to Paris to meet with uh, Ubisoft 
Paris guys and the Milan guys flew, flew there to meet together because Paris were working on it too. Yeah. And when I got there, I got uh, they all met me in the reception and I got tr- taken through the back of the studio through some big security doors with like keys so you couldn't get in. And I was a bit surprised thinking this is a bit, you know, heavy security for a Rabbids game, you know. Everyone knows the Rabbids are about, it's not like a super secret. Yeah. Uh, so, so when I got in, they took me to, to a side room um, with just Davide and Romain. Uh, it's, 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 it's spelled R O M A I N. I think it's Romar. I think it's their version of Norman. Yeah. So Romar Brio is the other director. And we're sat in the side room. And uh, David said, oh, I can not show you the game. So he turned the TV on and Mario stood on the TV. And I thought, perhaps I've been playing Mario because the board waiting for me to turn up, you know, from the airport. So, yeah. You know. yeah. Uh, and so he started moving Mario around. I was like, what's this? What, what are you doing? He said, well, this is a game. It's a Mario game. Has no one told you that? So I was like, no. Like, no one mentioned the fact that Mario was anywhere near the bloody game, you know. So I sat, I sat there. I felt the colour drain from my face because of sheer fear. And... Um, <laughs> They said that I sat, I, for the first hour, I kind of sat quiet and didn't say much, and they thought I didn't like the game. It's just because I was in shock. Like, because I was just, in my head, I was, even though I was looking at it going, oh my God, my head was saying, how on earth am I going to write music for Mario when Koji Kondo is the Mario master and yeah. the legend of video games? You know, how on earth am, am, am I, Grant Kirkup, going to possibly follow in his footsteps without making a complete arse of it? <laughs> um, you know, so it was kind of equal parts exciting, equal parts fear. Yeah, no, I can, I can imagine... I can I can imagine that would have been a um, completely sort of shock, a completely shocking experience, completely new experience. And I really did like the music in that game. I'm glad you did. Yeah. So, how would you compare video game scoring in general to scoring in film and TV, for example? I don't think it's any different. Yeah. I've got to say, I don't think about video games. You've got to keep in mind it's inter- it's interactive. Yes. And and you can't you can't always sculpt the music to totally fit the action apart from the cinematics. So in a movie, it's a li- it's a linear art form, never changes. Right. So you can make the music fit the fit the mood, the big moments, the big love scene, the big scary scene. You can you can craft it, it so it fits exactly right. And you have, but you have to take into account the dialogue. So you've got to keep it quiet under the dialogue, and then you know now it's time to put, make a big noise, etc. Like in games, it isn't like that. But I do feel that like. When I listen to some big video game soundtracks, they're no different to movie soundtracks these days. It's using live orchestra, it's great big massive things, it's like, it's no different. No, it's I agree. Just, yeah, I think, I think video games perhaps have got a wider variety. You get that, you go from chip tunes right, to, right up to full orchestra. Yeah. So it's got that huge great sway of music in the middle that's, it's, you know, it's, it's fantastically diverse. Um, so I feel that, um, I don't feel there's any difference in movies and video games, not in the technique of it or the way you write it. I think you might have to take into account the interactive part of it. Apart from that, no different. Yeah, I agree. And like even the the '90s sort of stuff on the on N64, like some of the some of those sound like you know they might not sound like a, a proper film score, but they sound sort of like a you know they could be compared to like the soundtrack to a children's TV show, like Thomas the Tank Engine or Noddy or something like that. Like the music. Yeah. Sorry, no, no, I totally agree. And I think that, yeah. you know, if you took the music from back then and reorchestrated it today with, with today's orchestras, it would sound it would sound exactly like a thumb score. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, I agree. So, um, sort of leading on from that, um, the, the sort of important question, the DK rap, what can you tell me about the production of this particular track? Well, it's a bit of a joke, really. Like, George Andre <laughs> was the lead, lead designer on, uh, with the head of the team on DK64. He'd been the... Uh, associate designer on uh, Banjo Kazooie, and we were good friends. And George, got, because George did a great job on Banjo, he got put head of the head of the team for uh, for DK. Uh, and he wanted it to be a bit like um, something like that kind of Jason Nevins Run DMC. You probably can't remember that track. It's probably before your time. Yeah. Um, wanted it quite fast. And I, I, I heard, when I saw the lyrics, I thought mm, I think it should be more like that funky Cold Medina song. But I can't remember who they wrote that, but whatever it is. So I found that drum beat like. Doo, 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 doo. Yeah. And I like, I, like the, I like the drum beat, so I kind of wrote the whole thing and put the lyrics to it and said, I want it to sound like this. And so George said, great, sounds great. So we're just, you know, singing about monkeys and bananas and grapes and all the rest of it. <laughs> I thought it's going to be a great joke. Everyone's going to get it. And of course, no one got it at all. So, you know, it was that thing where we, the, the reviews came out. We think the DK soundtrack is great, but what, what on earth is Grant Kirkup doing writing a rap, a rap song? You know, like, <laughs> everybody thought it was some kind of credible attempt to be an iced tea or whatever it was at the time, you know. <laughs> Um, I was like, that's not the point. It's supposed to be singing about bananas and monkeys and, you know, grapes and you know, all that nonsense. It's supposed to be a joke, you know, but no one took the joke except me. Yeah. <laughs> well, I kind of feel that it's taken like, you know, 15 to 20 years for people to finally get the joke. <laughs> people, I mean, people seem to like it now, but it's, it's taken a long time. Yeah, no, no, I, I can imagine. Like, I mean, when I first 
first played the game, I, I thought it was the most, I, think, I thought it was the funniest thing I'd heard in a while, so no, I, I certainly, I certainly got the humour side of it. <laughs> I think younger kids, yeah, I think younger kids got it, but anybody who's, a, who's approaching, like, teenage, cool years, didn't get it at all, but little kids got it. Yeah. Because they just thought it was a funny song about bananas and monkeys. Yeah. But and, and the older kids, were, were, you know, when you get to be 13, 14, 15, you, you think you're cool, don't you, right? So they didn't they didn't see it as I saw it. Yeah, no, I get that. So I'd imagine you get quite a bit of fan mail. What are your thoughts on people restoring or uncovering beta versions of the game and the musics and, and stuff? Um, I know a while ago you had some of the, the beta tracks of Banjo-Kazooie out. I think it's cool. I mean, you know, I think, you know, never. I, I, I hate that kind of that ego thing. I can't stand it. Yeah. I just think that I'm, I'm just a bloke that writes tunes that people, some people like here and there. And I think that's the that's the way I've always looked at it. And I think that people like my stuff and find other versions and remix stuff. It's just fantastic. Like when people remix my my, my tunes, it's generally better than I could have done ever. You know. So it's always like fantastic to hear people's ideas about how stuff might go. So. I think I think our stuff's all great. I think it makes for a great community. People find stuff, and I think it's it just it's, it's all part of that being a gamer. I think that kind of gamer community. It's generally pretty good natured, and I, I like it. It's great. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. It, it's always fascinating to see what people sort of dig out of those. I mean, I wish I could do that, but instead I sort of uh, work with the composers of kids shows with their dat tapes and stuff i wish i could uh, do all the data mining in those old n64 roms but uh, it's still cool to see what people get out of them you know it always amazes me how they get how they manage to do it like i've got no idea how it works so when they like pull stuff out the cartridge they can't believe it yeah exactly so um in conclusion so in retrospect how do you feel about you know your work on these games and what, what are your uh, sort of penultimate thoughts on it all I just think I've been very fortunate. I think that, and also, you know, being at Rare, Rare was a very private place. So, you know, we never did interviews. We kept it very quiet. Tim and Chris used to always say, you know, we're not pop stars, you know, we, we make games that like the games are the talking. There's no need to interview anybody. So we were kept very much in the dark for a lot of years. So after 12 years of coming out of Rare in a cave, I kind of, um, when I moved to America and stuff, like it was, it amazed me how, kind of how big like video game music has become, even back in, I moved to America in 2008. And it's only got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger since then. It's just, it's just a gigantic tour de force now. And I really feel that, like my son's 16, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, his music taste, he doesn't listen to a single popular artist at all. I mean, not not one. His playlist is, you know, it, it's on YouTube or on his, on his phone. It's just completely video game music. Yeah. There's nothing on it at all that's vaguely pop. My daughter likes pop stuff, but she likes video game stuff too. Yeah. But it's, you know, a lot of his friends just listen to video game music. Yeah. Which is like, you know, that's a, that's a massive change, you know, to when I was a kid. It didn't exist. You know, so I think that it's um, it's become an amazing thing. It's just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I think, you know, it's crossing over all the time now. Like you hear, like, almost like hear Game Boy, uh, you know, waveforms in some of the pop tunes today that it's that kind of really raw, basic synthesizer that just sounds like a Game Boy. It's amazing that it's, it's bleeding everywhere. You know, the fact that we've got like, great big video game orchestra tours going on around the world at any one time that and they sell out concert halls wherever they go like you know some of the big orchestras in the world do video game concerts to make money just to finance the rest of the stuff they do for the rest of the year because they can guarantee a sellout show in a video game concert i mean kids go mad for it yeah you know and the fact that you've got kids saying to their parents you know can you please take me to the symphony tonight their parents are like what are you talking about you want to go to the symphony yeah it's a video game concert i mean they can't believe it you know um so i think it's a uh, it's you know it's it's become its own thing. I still think it's looked upon a little bit as movies, you know, kind of younger sibling. Uh, and I do think it's, that it's that will slowly erode, and we will be on the same footing as movies. I don't think we're quite there yet, um, but there's certainly no reason for it um, to not be on the same footing as movies. Um, you know, the video game industry, you know, outgrossed the movie industry last year for the first time. Like outgrossed it by quite a lot. Um, that's spectacular when you've got movies like Avengers making a billion dollars. You know. Yeah. Um, Red Dead Redemption goes out and makes a billion dollars by itself. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's like it's incredible. So I think that I think the future's bright. That's what I think. I I, I reckon so too, and I certainly look forward to you know seeing what you do in future with other games and yeah. So um, thanks very much for being on the podcast. I really appreciate. It. Well, thanks for getting up so early. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> so um, yeah, um, talk to you guys later. See ya. All right then. All right, catch you later, Grant.
All right, bye. See ya.